Reformed churches and believers love the doctrine of the covenant. And the more we understand that doctrine, and the more we understand that it speaks of our God who is entirely different from every other idol men have conceived of, the more we love it. Therefore, we're happy that Prof. Inglesma agreed also to speak on Bavink's doctrine of the covenant. Thank you once again, Reverend Kuyper. It is obvious to me that the present generation of delegates to Classes West is far wiser than my generation was. Never once in the 25 years of my membership in Classes West did we schedule the spring meeting of the classes in Redlands, California. We met in such places as Northwest Iowa, Edgerton, Minnesota, and Isabel, South Dakota. Fine places, I am quick to add, but prone to frigid cold and howling blizzards the first week of March. I well remember a spring classes in Hall, Iowa in such circumstances. The blizzard struck during the day of the beginning of classes, at the beginning of classes. One of the few delegates who could get to his original and assigned lodging was the venerable elder delegate from Redlands, Tice Feenstra. The second day of the classes, he came to classes riding on a John Deere tractor through the drifts and dressed in clothing that made him look like a cross between an Eskimo and the men who live under bridges in <laughs> western Michigan. Herman Hanko and I were not so fortunate as to be able to get to our lodging that night in Dune, Iowa, where he was yet a pastor. It was, impo it was impossible to get out of Hull. Emergency measures had to be taken, and the two of us were put up for the night in a small, upstairs, freezing bedroom in town. There was one bed, and that bed was six feet long, with an impenetrable footboard. When we rose up from our prayers at the side of the bed, our eyes met, and each of us knew what the other was saying. Do not touch me. <laughs> Sunshine, balmy breezes, palm trees, and flowers the first week of March are preferable. The present generation is wiser than my generation was. Turn with me now to the subject, the great subject of Bavink's Doctrine of the Covenant. For Herman Bavink, the Doctrine of the Covenant was not only one Reformed doctrine among many, it was not even the most important doctrine of all, but it was the doctrine of which all other doctrines revealed in Scripture and confessed by the Reformed faith are the outworkings, implications, and aspects the analogy in the human body would not be the skeletal framework or even the heart, but the principle of life itself that takes form in all the members and accounts for all the functions of the human body. That, in the thinking of Bavink, was the significance of the truth of the covenant with regard to all of the other truths revealed in Scripture and confessed by the Reformed faith. The covenant is simply, and now I quote Bavink, I will be quoting from the Reformed dogmatics unless I say otherwise in this speech. The covenant is simply, quote, the essence of the true religion, end of quote. Bavink expressed this significance of the covenant negatively in his book, Ruping and Vedrakaborta, Calling and Regeneration, 
having spoken of the, quote, deep, glorious covenant conception, which occupies such an important place in Reformed doctrine, end of quote, Bavinck said, quote, the Reformed confession and theology can be understood in no single point apart from this doctrine of the covenant, end of quote. In taking up the doctrine of the covenant in Bavinck, therefore, we are treating of the essence of that theologian and his theology. Because he was correct in his judgment about the covenant and its importance, we now are considering the essence of the Christian faith as expressed by Hermann Bavinck. Implied is that that church that gets the covenant wrong is going to go wrong in all of the rest of doctrine. Implied also is that the church that gets the doctrine of the covenant right will get all of the rest of Christian doctrine right as well. Our consideration of Bavinck's doctrine of the covenant at this conference is timely. For one thing, the heresy of the federal vision, a theology of the covenant, as their own name for their theology indicates, has occasioned, indeed demanded, a renewed interest in the doctrine of the covenant, especially among the Reformed churches where the heresy of the federal vision has surfaced. For another thing, in the providence of God, the English-speaking and English-reading public now has Bavinck's own teaching about the covenant available to them in the translation into English of Bavinck's great work, the four volumes of his dogmatics. Hitherto, for the most part, those four volumes have been available only to those who could read the Dutch language, of course. Although you would not know it from the writings about the Federal Vision and the writings about Bavinck by theologians outside the Protestant Reformed churches, it now becomes evident to all, not only that the highly regarded Bavinck rejects and condemns the federal theology of the federal vision, but also that Bavinck repudiates the doctrine of the covenant that has produced the federal vision, a doctrine of the covenant that is widely held and loudly heralded as reformed orthodoxy, and the overwhelming reformed tradition by most Reformed churches. The doctrine of the covenant that Bavinck repudiates, although you wouldn't know that from reading most of the writings about Bavinck today, is a doctrine of the covenant that views the covenant as a contract or a pact between God and all baptized members of the church, particularly all baptized babies, which contract according to the popular doctrine, is conditional, that is, dependent on the deeds of obedience on the part of the baptized, and therefore a breakable covenant. The significance of the publication of Bavinck's Reform Dogmatics is that no longer can Reformed theologians get away with passing their doctrine of the covenant off as Bavinck's. Because of Bavinck's towering stature, in the Reformed tradition, no longer are Reformed theologians able to glorify the doctrine of a conditional covenant as the prevailing covenant doctrine in the Reformed tradition. What I intend in this address is an overview, necessarily succinct, of the whole of Bavinck's doctrine of the covenant, from its root and foundation in the eternal triune God to its full fruition in the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ. Because I have recently set forth Bavinck's doctrine of the covenant of grace in a book, Covenant and Election, I will be very brief about this important aspect of the covenant. I will sketch it for the benefit of those who may not have read the book, but I will take the opportunity to treat aspects of the doctrine of the covenant that I did not treat in the book. And then I want to consider Bavinck's doctrine of the covenant of works in Adam 
and his doctrine of what he regarded as a covenant of common grace with Noah. And I will conclude again with a very brief summary and analysis. Let's look first of all then at the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ. What did Bob Inc. teach about the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ? Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the covenant of grace not only conflicts with, but also condemns the prevailing doctrine of the covenant in Reformed churches other than the Protestant Reformed churches. And Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the covenant condemns the prevailing doctrine of the covenant of grace at every point. This prevailing doctrine of the covenant, of course, is the root of the heresy of the federal vision and the reason why the churches are not able to take hold of the federal vision at its root. Bavink taught that the covenant, which is the essence of the Christian religion, is a relationship of fellowship between God the Creator and his creature, man. I'll point out later that by the creature man here, Bavink meant elect man and stated that in so many words. In the context of his assertion that the covenant is the essence of true religion, Bavink describes the covenant as, quote, the relation of God to his people, end quote, adding that the relation is, quote, fellowship, end quote. In the section of the dogmatics in which he treats the covenant of grace directly and expressly, Bavink calls the covenant, quote, true fellowship between God and man, end of quote. So important is the view of the covenant as fellowship or communion that I want to quote Bob Inc. at length on that aspect of the covenant from another book, his book on calling and regeneration. Religion, this is a quotation from Bob Inc. Religion is, according to its essence, nothing less than fellowship. The Dutch is gemeenschap with God, the deepest, most intimate, tenderest fellowship, which after that of the three persons in the divine being and after that of the two natures in Christ is conceivable and can exist. Scripture expresses that in the beautiful doctrine of the covenant. For the covenant is that deed of God by which he places the man in relation to himself and causes him to live forever in his fellowship. And that fellowship is more intimate and tenderer than that of husband and wife. Notice the figure here. Bavink picks up on the biblical figure, the symbol of the covenant, the relation of a husband and wife. More intimate and tender than that of husband and wife, of vine and branches, of foundation and building. Scripture can find no words and images strong and clear enough to enable us to understand that fellowship in some measure. And then immediately after this quotation, Bob Inc. added this, the biblical covenant is not a contract such as between a Lord and his servant. Perhaps the elders and other lay members of the church do not appreciate this as much as the ministers do. But for all of our history as separate churches, we have had to hear from theologians and ministers on the outside that our doctrine that the covenant is communion with God is a novelty, has no rootage in the reformed tradition, and has against it the giants of the reformed faith in the past. That notion is shattered by Bavink's description of the covenant as communion with God. How Bavink regarded the covenant as to its nature is apparent from his locating the first revelation of the covenant of grace in the promise of Genesis 3.15, which according to Bavink, quote, 
already contains the entire covenant in a nutshell and all the benefits of grace, end of quote. Bavink explains Genesis 3.15 as God's breaking of the fellowship of man with Satan and establishing the fellowship of Adam and Eve and the elect church with God himself. This conception of the covenant contrasts with the popular conception of the covenant as an agreement or a contract or a bargain. Bavink taught in the second place that the covenant of grace is established, maintained, and perfected by God and by God alone. According to Bavink, the covenant, and this is his own word, is unilateral. In light of God's sovereignty, writes Bavink, the covenant, the covenant is, quote, unilateral, end quote. It is not, quote, a compact, but a pledge, end quote. A little later, Bavink expressed that also the maintenance of the covenant is unilateral. That is the work of God alone. I quote, the covenant of grace is indeed unilateral. It proceeds from God. He has designed and defined it. He maintains and implements it. It is a work of the triune God and is totally completed among the three persons themselves. End of quote. In a lovely little work that, so far as I know, has not been translated yet into English, called De Offeranda des Lofs, The Offering of Praise, Bavink says this, about the covenants being one-sided or established and maintained by God alone. Quote, the covenant is no mutual treaty. It is not like an agreement between two persons which they know how to bring about after weighing the pros and the cons. With mutual consultation and after mutual approval, but the covenant of grace is an instituting, that is, a gracious disposing of God, a gift in Jesus Christ. When Bavink then speaks of the covenants becoming bilateral, as he does, he does not at all mean that whereas the original establishment of the covenant with a person is God's work, but that from then on, the maintaining of the covenant depends both upon God and the sinner. Rather, he tells us himself that what he means by bilateral is, quote, that the covenant is destined to be consciously and voluntarily accepted and kept by humans, and then he adds, in the power of God. The very nature of the covenant is that it is a relationship. When God establishes that relationship, he intends that we consciously and willingly enter into that relationship, love that relationship, embrace that relationship. That's what he means by bilateral. And even that, he says, is in the power of God. This doctrine of the covenant is in contradiction of the popular teaching today that the covenant depends for its maintenance not only upon the promising God, but also upon the sinner's performing conditions. Third, Bavink taught about the covenant of grace that God establishes and maintains the covenant by his sure promise. This is what he meant in one of my earlier quotations where I read him to say that the covenant is not a compact but a pledge. It isn't established by two parties agreeing to something. It's established by a divine pledge, and a pledge is a sure promise. Bavink identified the promise by which the covenant is established and maintained and described its significance for the covenant in his own summary of the four volumes of the Reformed Dogmatics. He himself summarized the four volumes of the dogmatics in one thick volume to which he gave the significant title Magnalia Dei, 
Latin for the wonderful works of God. And this is what he wrote himself about the place of the promise in the establishment of the covenant. I quote, The one great all-embracing promise of the covenant of grace is this, I will be your God and the God of your seed. Genesis 7 verse 8. And in this promise everything is included and the entire acquiring and applying of salvation, Christ and all his benefits, the Holy Ghost and all his gifts, from the mother promise in Genesis 3.15 to the apostolic benediction in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 13, there runs one straight line in the love of the Father, of the grace, the grace of the Son, and the communion of the Holy Ghost. All salvation of the sinner is included. End of quote. The very next sentence reads as follows, quote, We do well to emphasize that this promise is not conditional, but is as certain, the Dutch is beslist, and firm, the Dutch is stelich, as possible. According to Bob Inc., God has established the covenant of grace by this sure promise, not with the church first of all, nor with each individual elect directly, and certainly not with all baptized members of the visible church, or by, whether by confession of faith or by baptism. Rather, according to Bob Inc., God has established the covenant with the man, Jesus Christ, who is head of the covenant of grace, as Adam was the head of the covenant of creation in paradise. This is another fundamental aspect of Bob Inc.'s doctrine of the covenant. The question, the important question, the controversial question is, with whom has God established the covenant? To whom has he made this sure promise? And Bavank's answer is, Jesus Christ as the head of the covenant. Now this truth is decisive in the great struggle that is going on as I speak between two conflicting doctrines of the covenant in the Reformed churches, a controversy brought to a head by the heresy of the federal vision. I quote Bob Inc. on this important point. God made the covenant of grace not with one who was solely a human, but with the man Christ Jesus, who was his only begotten, much beloved son. Again and again, Bob Inc. calls Jesus Christ, quote, the head of the covenant of grace, end quote. Adam and Christ, he states, are, quote, two covenant heads, end quote. The teaching that Jesus Christ is head of the covenant is the death blow to the doctrine of the covenant that holds that the covenant is a conditional relation with every baptized member of the visible church, established by conditional divine promise to all the baptized members of the visible church alike. The implication of the teaching that God has established the covenant of grace with Jesus Christ as head of the new covenant by solemn promise to Jesus Christ as the head is that the covenant is certain and steadfast. It is unbreakable. And this is the implication that Bavink himself draws from his doctrine of Christ's headship of the covenant. Having stated that God made the covenant not with one who is merely a human, but with his divine only begotten and well-beloved son, Christ Jesus, Bavink adds, quote, in him, that's Christ Jesus, this covenant has an unwaveringly firm foundation. It can no longer be broken. It is, as everlast, it is an everlasting covenant. It rests not in any work 
of humans, but solely in the good pleasure of God, in the work of the mediator, in the Holy Spirit, who remains forever. It is not dependent on any human condition. That's the, bo- that's the language not of Herman Uxema, that's the language of Herman Bavink. It is not dependent on any human condition. It does not wait for any law keeping on the part of humans. It is of, through, and for grace. God himself is the sole and eternal being, the faithful and true being, in whom it rests, and who establishes, maintains, executes, and completes it. The covenant of grace is the divine work par excellence, his work alone and his work totally. All boasting is excluded here for humans. All glory is due to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. End quote. That's taken from volume three of the Reformed Dogmatics. As this long quotation demonstrates, indeed explicitly states, for Bavink, the covenant of grace is unconditional. Elsewhere, in his small book, The Offering of Praise, a work that explains the connection between baptism and the Lord's Supper for baptized children of the covenant, Bavink wrote this, I quote, Faith and conversion are no conditions outside and unto the covenant of grace, but they are benefits in that covenant, presupposing the communion with Christ and opening the way to the enjoyment of its benefits. End of quote. Bavink's doctrine of an unconditional and therefore unbreakable covenant of grace with Jesus Christ as held by the Protestant Reformed churches, stands in diametrical opposition to the liberated and federal vision doctrine of a conditional breakable covenant with all the baptized children alike. Bavink spoke of the indissolubility of the covenant inasmuch as it is made with Jesus Christ. Now, if the covenant is made with Jesus Christ as the head of his elect people, the covenant is made also with Christ's elect church and with Christ's elect church exclusively. That follows from the headship of Christ in the covenant. But that was also the implication that Bavink himself drew from his doctrine. Contrary to the popular covenant doctrine that cuts the covenant loose from election in the conviction that relating covenant and election is a horrible theological and practical error, that's the impression that theologians in the churches like to leave with their people and with us. If you relate covenant and election, you are committing one of the most dreadful theological sins that are possible to be committed. But I say in contrast to that notion, Bavink emphasized that the covenant of grace is closely related to election and that to separate the covenant from election is false doctrine of enormous proportion and with grievous practical consequences. Here, Bavink, on the relation of covenant and election, I quote, Election is the basis and guarantee, the heart and core of the covenant of grace. End quote. Again, the covenant relation did not depend on the law as an antecedent condition. It was not a covenant of works, but rested solely in God's electing love. In his explanation of the covenant as the basis of the reform practice of infant baptism, Bavink reflected on the close relation of covenant and election. The covenant, I quote, the covenant 
is the realization of election in an organic and historical way, end quote. So far was Bavink from thinking that relating covenant and election is a theological error that he sharply warned against separating the covenant from election. I quote, When the covenant of grace is separated from election, it ceases to be a covenant of grace and becomes again a covenant of works. Now apply that to the covenant doctrine that prevails in Presbyterian and Reformed churches today. If Bob Inc. is right, and he is right, then what they have done is to make out of the covenant of grace another covenant of works. That is, a covenant that depends upon the works that sinners do. And that is a denial of the gospel of salvation by grace alone. Bob Inc. then added to that warning that I've just quoted. It is so indispensably important to cling to this close relationship between covenant and election because the least weakening of it not merely robs one of the true insight into the achieving and application of salvation, but also robs the believers of their only and sure comfort in the practice of their spiritual life." End of quote. Bob Inc. was a son of the secession. He was a practical man. All of theology should be warm and should be applied. He applies it here. Separate the covenant, the relationship between you and God, or between me and God, from election. Make of it a covenant of works instead. And at that moment, you lose, I lose, the assurance of salvation. That's the practical significance of the connection between covenant and election, according to Bavink. The truth that, as made with Christ, the head of the covenant, the covenant is established by God only with the elect in Christ, decides the issue whether infant baptism means the establishment of the covenant with all the baptized infants alike, as is the popular covenant doctrine in Reformed and Presbyterian churches today. Bavink consistently taught that the covenant of grace is established only with the elect infants of believers. In my covenant and election, I quote Bavink from his Reform dogmatics, that elect infants are of the covenant, whereas other infants, reprobate infants, are merely in the administration of the covenant. Or as Bavink says, in the covenant only externally. Here is an even sharper, clearer statement by Bob Inc., found again in that little book, The Offering of Praise, where the subject is the relation between infant baptism and partaking of the Lord's Supper. Quote, Election and covenant are therefore not distinguished as a narrower and a broader sphere, for they both comprise or contain the same persons." End of quote. It could not be more clearly stated. Covenant is not broader than election, as though the covenant includes many persons, all the baptized members of the visible church, whereas election, of course, only includes the elect infants. But for Bavink, Election and covenant comprise, omfatten in the Dutch, consist of or contain the same persons. Bavink's emphasis on the close relation of covenant and election becomes even stronger in his explanation of the connection between the covenant of grace in history and its foundation in the eternal council and ultimately the eternal being of God. Now I turn to what 
in Reformed dogmatics is commonly called the Pactum Salutis, the Pact of Salvation, and which has to do with the root or source or foundation of the covenant of grace in time and history in eternity. Bavinck's treatment of the foundation and root of the covenant of grace in the eternal God is part of my exposition this morning of Bavinck's doctrine of the covenant of grace in Christ. Bavinck affirms that the covenant of grace has its, quote, foundation, end quote, quote, in eternity, end quote. Bavink is critical of the traditional teaching that the foundation and root in eternity of the covenant of grace is an agreement in eternity between the Father and the Son. That's a popular notion in Reformed churches today. The root of the covenant then is described as an agreement between the Father and the Son. And that is what they have in mind when they speak of the pact of salvation or the counsel of redemption. Bavink is critical of that. This conception is characterized, says Bavink, by, quote, scholastic subtlety, end of quote. And he observes that there is no biblical basis for that idea of the root and foundation of the covenant of grace. The main biblical proof that is adduced for that scholastic notion is Zechariah 6, verse 13. And Bavink points out that Zechariah 6, verse 13 isn't speaking at all about any agreement between the first and second persons of the Trinity, but rather is referring to the union of the kingly and priestly offices of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So there's no biblical basis for that popular uh, view of a certain aspect of the covenant of grace. Well, what is the foundation and root in eternity of the covenant of grace? For Bavink, the foundation in eternity of the covenant of grace is God's decree of election. But God's decree of election, not as God's election of the church, not God's election of you and me, but God's election of the man, Jesus Christ, as the head of the covenant. Quote, the covenant of grace does not hang in the air, but rests on an eternal, unchanging foundation. It is firmly grounded in the counsel and covenant of the triune God, and is the application and execution of it that infallibly follows. The covenant of grace was ready-made from all eternity in the pact of salvation of the three persons. Bavink uses that common term, phrase, pact of salvation, but pours his own content into it. And was realized by Christ from the moment the fall occurred. End of quote. Similarly, quote, the covenant relation rested solely in God's electing love. Quote. And then again, quote, the covenant is the realization of election in an organic, a living, and historical way. So the root and foundation of the covenant is God's decree of election as the election of Christ as the head of the covenant. And of course with that, the election of all of the church. And that makes plain that for Bavink, the covenant of grace is made not with all the baptized infants or all those who may enter the church by confession of faith, but with the elect alone. If its root and foundation is the decree of election, then the covenant of grace will be established with the elect in Christ and with them alone. Even though he asserts that the foundation of the covenant is the eternal decree of election, Bavink suggests that there is still a deeper root and foundation of the covenant than the decree of election. He writes, quote, the pact of salvation, which we now understand for Bavink is the divine decree or counsel 
of the covenant, the pact of salvation makes known to us the relationship and life of the three persons in the divine being as a covenantal life, a life of consummate self-consciousness and freedom. Here, within the divine being, the covenant flourishes to the full. End of quote. Thus, Bavink points to the eternal life of communion in the Godhead as the deepest source of the covenant of grace, viewed as fellowship between God and his elect people in Christ. This is one reason why it is abundantly evident to me that Hermann Huxema, who seldom indicated his sources, was influenced strongly by, Va- by Bavank with regard to the doctrine of the covenant and built on Bavank's doctrine of the covenant. By this time it is also abundantly evident that the prevailing covenant conception in the Reformed and Presbyterian churches finds no support in Bavank. And here we should keep in mind that What Bavink thought he was doing in the Reformed dogmatics, and particularly regarding the doctrine of the covenant, is summing up and systematizing the teaching of Scripture as it had come down from Calvin in the Reformed confessions and was officially stated in the Reformed creeds. Here, then, we have the Reformed tradition, the prevailing Reformed tradition with regard to the covenant of grace. Before we leave Bavink's doctrine of the covenant of grace, we ought to survey his doctrine of the Sinaitic covenant, or the Old Testament covenant with Israel. I have two reasons for doing this. First, the covenant of God with Israel, or as it's known, the Sinaitic covenant, was a form or administration of the covenant of grace, a very important form and administration of the covenant of grace. My second reason for bringing this up is that in the current covenant controversy occasioned by the federal vision, there is an erroneous view and explanation of the covenant of God with Israel. This erroneous view stems from a Presbyterian theologian by the name of Meredith Klein. And some who are promoting Meredith Klein's explanation of the covenant with Israel are the much-published faculty of Westminster Seminary in Escondido, California. Their view of the covenant with Israel is that although the spiritual aspect of that covenant was an administration of the covenant of grace, there was another aspect of the covenant, the earthly aspect, that was in fact a republication of the covenant of works. And they refer here to the earthly aspect of God's covenant with Old Testament Israel, the aspect that promised earthly blessings and that promised the inheritance of the land of Canaan. All of that, they say, was an administration of the covenant of works and not an aspect of the covenant of grace. That earthly aspect, therefore, depended upon Israel's obedience to the law and not upon God's gracious promise in Jesus Christ. We do well, therefore, to take a brief look at Bavink's doctrine of the Sinaitic Covenant. Bavink's doctrine of the covenant of God with Israel was that it was in its entirety an administration of the covenant of grace. An administration of the covenant that earlier had been established with Abraham and that was established originally in the mother promise of Genesis 3.15. The whole of the covenant of God with Israel was an administration of the covenant of grace that would be fulfilled in the covenant with the church in Jesus Christ. 
According to Bob Inc., the covenant with Abraham continued, quote, in another form at Sinai with Israel, end quote. Again, the covenant on Mount Sinai is and remains a covenant of grace, end quote. For this view of the Sinaitic covenant, Bob Inc. appealed to Exodus 20, verse 2, the preface to the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Bavink added the observation that this covenant with Israel at Sinai is unbreakable, something that of course cannot be said about that covenant if it is an administration of a covenant of works. Bavink's further explanation of the Sinaitic covenant and defense of his view of it as a form of the covenant of grace exposes the error of Meredith Klein and his present-day disciples. The difference between the Sinaitic Covenant and the New Testament Covenant of Grace for Bavink is that the Old Testament Covenant consists, quote, all the, of all the spiritual and eternal benefits of grace, but clothed with sensory forms, end quote. Keep in mind that Klein and his disciples view those earthly aspects of the covenant with Israel, particularly the land of Canaan, as earthly realities in themselves. They don't see those earthly aspects of the covenant with Israel as sensory or typical aspects of the spiritual covenant of grace. With regard to the law that is so prominent in the covenant with Israel, Bavink explained the significance of that law in the light of Galatians 3 and 4. There, in Galatians 3 and 4, the apostle denies that the law abrogated the gracious promise and covenant earlier made with Abraham. Galatians 3 verse 17. The apostle goes on to assert that the law, so prominent in the Sinaitic covenant, quote, was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, end quote. That's a quotation of Galatians 3, verse 19. In general, therefore, Bavink contended that the law of the Sinaitic covenant was, quote, our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, end quote. Galatians 3, verse 24. Bavink ends his treatment of the covenant with Israel by declaring, quote, the law was not a covenant of works in disguise, end of quote. Alas, what Bavink denied concerning the covenant at Sinai he allowed regarding the covenant with Adam in paradise prior to the fall. I turn now to Bavink's doctrine of the covenant with Adam, an important aspect of his covenant doctrine as of the covenant doctrine of all Reformed theologians. Bavink's doctrine of the covenant with Adam was that there was a covenant with Adam, to be sure, but that that covenant was, quote, a covenant of works, end of quote. He called it a, quote, covenant of works, end quote, Latin, fetus operum. And he explained the covenant with Adam as a covenant of works. These were the main elements of Bavink's doctrine of the covenant with Adam. First, Bavink insisted that the relation between God and Adam was a covenant. He found the basis for that in the right reading of Hosea 6, verse 7, where the right translation has not that Israel broke the covenant like men, but broke the covenant like Adam, Ka'adam, which can either be a generic name for the human race or the personal name of the first man, Adam. But Bavink argues as well 
that the only relation that is ever possible between God and a human being is a covenant relation. So first of all, he contended that even though the word covenant does not occur in those opening chapters of Genesis, the relation between God and Adam was a covenant relation. Second, Bavink taught that this covenant with Adam was established by the command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Quote, the command given to Adam was, in the essence of the matter, a covenant, because it intended to convey eternal life to Adam in the way of obedience. End quote. I only call attention to that last phrase now. I'm going to say something more about that in a moment. In the way of obedience, Bavink does not dare to say what his doctrine commits him to say on the basis of his obedience. That's an indication that he himself was not as sure about his view of the covenant with Adam as he ought to have been. Third, Bavink's doctrine was that the covenant with Adam was a genuine covenant of works in Bavink's thinking, because in it God promised, I'm quoting now, the blessedness of heaven, eternal life, and the enjoyment of the beatific vision, the vision of God, end quote, on the basis of Adam's obedience to the probationary command. Bavink thought that by obeying God's command, Adam could have attained the highest life the life that Christ has obtained for the new human race by his death and resurrection. And then fourth, Bavink emphasized the necessity of confessing a covenant of works with Adam. Only the Arminians and Socinians deny the covenant of works with Adam, he charged. Contemporary defenders of the covenant of works with Adam appeal to Bavink against the rejection of it by Hermann Huxema and the Protestant Reformed churches. How should we respond to this appeal to Hermann Bavink on the part of our critics? First, Bavink flatly denied the possibility of merit before the fall, as well as after the fall. Quote, There is no such thing as merit in the existence of a creature before God, nor can there be. This is true after the fall, but no less before the fall. End of the quotation from Bavink. This true statement nullifies Bavink's own explanation of the covenant with Adam as a covenant of works. Because in fact, if Adam could have obtained a higher and better life by his own obedience to the command not to eat of the forbidden tree, Adam would have merited or earned that higher and better life. Defenders of the covenant of works with Adam are compelled to acknowledge this. Dr. C. Venema, of, Mid-America, of West, uh, Western, uh, Westminster Seminary West in Southern California has, no, Venema of Mid-America Seminary, I correct myself. Dr. C. Venema of Mid-America Seminary has written that Adam could have merited eternal life, although his reformed conscience forced him to put the word merited in quotation marks. Bavink denies that there can ever be merit with God, whether before the fall or after the fall. Second, Bavink is usually very careful to state that Adam would have acquired eternal life, quote, in the way of obedience, end quote, rather than, quote, on the basis of, quote, end quote, obedience. Bavink himself thus shied away from the bold statement of a true covenant of works, indicating his own hesitation concerning the doctrine that he was teaching. And in the third place, our response to those who criticize us for denying a covenant of works with Adam ought to be our pointing out that the real concern of Bavink 
regarding Adam's position in the Garden of Eden was twofold. One of Bovink's real concerns was that Adam be recognized as standing in a covenant relation with God and a covenant relation to the human race such that Adam represented the entire race as its federal head before God. The other deep concern and real concern of Bovink was that Adam's state in paradise, glorious as it was, was not and was not intended by God to be the final destiny either of Adam or of the human race. In fact, the heading of the section of the Reformed Dogmatics in which Bavank treats of Adam, of the image of God, and of the covenant with Adam, significantly is titled, The Destiny of Man. Now both of those real concerns of Bavank are met without any embracing of the notion that Adam by his obedience, could have obtained, that is, merited the higher, better life for himself and the race that Jesus Christ, in fact, has earned by his obedience to the will of God. There was certainly a covenant between God and Adam. In that covenant, Adam was the legal head of the entire race, so that his disobedience plunged the entire race into a state of guilt before God and into a condition of total depravity. But it is not necessary to hold that in that covenant Adam might have earned a higher life. When adversaries perversely charge the ministers of the Protestant Reformed churches with deviation from the Reformed tradition, and specifically with deviation from Bavink, in that the ministers in the Protestant Reformed churches deny a covenant of works, the response must be that Bavink's insistence on the covenant of works with with Adam had in view the teaching that there was a covenant with Adam in which Adam was representative head, and this we confess. We maintain also that the destiny of Adam and the race as established by God from the outset was much higher than Adam's paradisial state. However, God never intended that that higher and better destiny be achieved through the first Adam. But God always intended, as Colossians 1 verses 13 teaches, that that higher and better destiny of the race be achieved by the incarnation, atonement, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the second and last Adam, as Paul describes him in 1 Corinthians 15. The man who is the Lord from heaven and whose heavenly image we were always destined to bear, just as once we have borne the image of the earthy. So we take issue with Bavink's doctrine of the covenant with Adam, and we must also take issue with Bavink's doctrine of the covenant with Noah. Although here, too, we do not inflict any real damage on Bavink's overall covenant doctrine regarding the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ. Bavink regarded the covenant with Noah, of which we read in Genesis 6, verse 18, and 9, verses 8 and following, as a covenant of common grace, and called it that. According to Bavink, the covenant with Noah was not the same as the covenant of grace revealed to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 15, and established with Abraham and his seed in Genesis 17, verse 7. Bavink names the covenant with Noah variously, quote, covenant of common grace, end quote, quote, a covenant of long suffering, end quote, and quote, the covenant of nature, 
End quote. Even though that covenant, according to Bavink, is different from the covenant of grace, the covenant with Noah is related to the covenant of special saving grace, and it's related in this way that the covenant with Noah prepares for the coming of Jesus Christ and educates the human race so that the race desires Jesus Christ and salvation and is, quote, susceptible, end quote, to salvation in Christ. There was more to the covenant of God with Noah, conceived as a covenant of common grace, therefore, than merely keeping the human race physically alive and in good health. The covenant of common grace has a spiritual aspect for Bavink and serves a spiritual purpose. And this comes out in Bavink's consideration of general revelation, which for Bavink is common grace to the unbelieving peoples and nations of the world. Bavink criticizes Luther for denying the right to Aristotle of speaking in theological matters. By virtue of the covenant of common grace, there is yet truth in all pagan religions. Muhammad, therefore, is not simply an imposter and an enemy of God, according to Bavink, explaining and applying the covenant with Noah. There is, according to Bavink, quote, an operation of God's spirit and of his common grace also in the religions of unbelieving humans, end of quote. Quote again, Christianity is also paganism's fulfillment, end of quote. Christ is, quote, the desire of all the Gentiles, end of quote. The application of the covenant with Noah, according to Bavink, is that it affords a common basis of Christians and non-Christians. It is a point of contact for Christians with non-Christians. And then as a kind of abysmal climax of the praise of the covenant of common grace, Bavink wrote this, quote, Natural theology was earlier rightly called a preamble of faith, a divine preparation, and nurture to Christendom. General revelation is the foundation upon which special revelation raises itself. End of quote. In view of the later speech at this conference, I limit myself to Bavink's explanation of the covenant with Noah with regard to his doctrine of common grace. I note, first of all, that in his explanation of the covenant with Noah, Bavink rather assumes his explanation than proves it. If there is any basis of his explanation, it is apparently the extension of the covenant with Noah to the earth, to every living creature, and to all nations and peoples of the world, Noah's seed after him. But in criticism of this explanation, Romans 8 verses 19 through 21 explains the covenant with Noah in such a way as to show that it was a revelation of the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ with regard to the fullest extent of the covenant of grace of God in Jesus Christ, extending to all nations in the elect among them, and even to the earthly creation itself that groans to be delivered from its present vanity, and that one day will be the recreated home of the elect human race in Jesus Christ. Bavink's explanation of the covenant with Noah destroys his emphasis on the unity of the covenant of grace, despite his efforts to relate the covenant of common grace with the covenant of special grace in Jesus Christ. Living as we do some 100 years after Bavink, and I may add Kuyper's doctrine of common grace, and particularly explanation of the covenant with Noah, we are witnesses of the damage that this conception of the covenant with Noah has done, both in the United States and in the Netherlands, 
where it has been embraced. In summary, in Bavinck's theology is a sound confession and glorious development of the truth of the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ. Bavinck emphasized and indicated the comprehensive significance of a reformed doctrine of the covenant. It is fundamental to all of the truth of the Christian religion, including the ethical truth of the Christian religion. Specific aspects of the covenant that stand out that I have already noted in Bavinck's doctrine of the covenant of grace include the headship of Christ in the covenant, and from this and in accordance with this also the establishment of the covenant with the elect and with the elect only, the unconditionality of the covenant, the firmness and indissolubility of the covenant with its implied comfort for the man or the woman who is in covenant relation with Christ by faith. This doctrine of the covenant exposes and condemns the covenant doctrine of the liberated reformed and many other churches besides and their disciples, the men of the federal vision. The significance of Bob Inc.'s covenant doctrine, now in English for the first time, for theological developments in our day, include the following. It indicates that the covenant doctrine of Huxima and of the Protestant Reformed churches has solid teaching in the Reformed tradition. It has solid backing in Bavink, of course, but also in the preceding tradition that Bavink sums up. Bavink rejects and condemns as a covenant of works the doctrine of the covenant of the liberated reformed and of the federal vision, a conditional covenant doctrine that it's held by many reformed and Presbyterian churches today. Herman Huxema and the Protestant Reformed churches have embraced, developed, and purified the covenant doctrine of Bavink. The Protestant Reformed churches confess the covenant of grace essentially as taught by Bavink. And the Protestant Reformed churches have purified Bavink's covenant doctrine with regard to his conception of the covenant with Adam, with regard to his conception of the covenant with Noah. But Huxema has also developed Bavink's covenant doctrine. He has clearly distinguished the source of the covenant of grace as the council of the covenant and as the Trinitarian being of God as fellowship. Huxema also clarified that the covenant promise is for the elect infants only, which is more implied in Bavink than expressed. And thus, the Protestant Reformed churches may take encouragement from the theology of Hermann Bavink. Thank you for your attention.